Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast, presented exclusively on the Chop Sports channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We're recording this on Thursday, March 23rd. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, it's the international break, so we're going to go a little bit loose. I'm going to pick up on some things that I haven't chatted about, like the Champions League draw, what's going on. But really, I'm just going to chat about some things that are in my wheelhouse. Come along for the ride, enjoy it, and feel free to like, subscribe, and just get involved in the show. If you want to know about the WhatsApp group, please let us know. But first, let's get to the Champions League draw. That happened, and I forgot to chat about it because I was just kind of like in the weeds of the season. So we'll go through it. We've got Real Madrid versus Chelsea. Manchester City versus Bayern Munich. We're going to get on to more about Bayern Munich in a minute. Napoli, not sorry, Napoli versus Milan, Benfica versus Inter. Now, something that's interesting about this draw is that they've already squared away the semifinals. So all the big boys in Europe are on one bracket, one bracket, one bracket. We have Real, Chelsea, Manchester City, and Bayern Munich all on one side. So you've got Real Madrid, previous champions Chelsea champions before that and Bayern Munich champions before that so three of the last four champions are on one side along with Manchester City who were a semi who were a finalist versus Chelsea and are perennial favorites so for my friends um in Manchester City we are a little worried about this one it's a little bit sad although Erling Holland did say that he was brought to Manchester City to win the Champions League. And I loved his bravado. I loved what he said about it. He's leading both in goals and expected goals. So Erling Holland is just the man, and hopefully he can get this team going. But City will have to defeat Bayern Munich. The first leg is at home. Now, why does the first leg at home matter? Because you know the result you have to chase down. And it's better to be at home in the second leg so that you don't just have to try and run up scores. All the great moments in Champions League history tend to come in that second leg at home. If you think about last season, Real Madrid came back down two goals at home. Uh, Liverpool famously came back four goals at home in the second leg against Barcelona. So that's what's interesting there. Uh, Let's sort of go through Real Madrid. Just lost the Clásico. They're having a bit of a rough season domestically, but we know never question a heart of a champion and Real Madrid draw Chelsea, who they'll probably feel good about beating. Um, Chelsea just had a pretty bad performance. The Grand Potter experience is not great, but they're playing well in the Champions League and Chelsea will have the home leg second. So that should help them. Um, I could see Chelsea pulling this out, but again, it's Real Madrid. Take that as you will. For City, we have another moment where we could end up suffering. Uh, and I'm going to talk about suffering a little bit later on in the show. You know, it's Bayern Munich. It's Pep's former team. It's not Nagelsmann. We'll get to that in a second. And Bayern Munich coming off four performances where their normal romp to the German title has been derailed because of lackadaisical, it's really hard to win a ninth title in a row. As Although, from what I understand, and I learned this on the TIFO podcast uh, from uh, Seb Safford Blah, F- Safford Bleu, yeah, Bleu uh, of the TIFO group and the Athletic, Bayern Munich is the only team that's really covered nationally in Germany. So the pressure on them is real. Like there's a reason why they won nine and 10 titles in a row. Everything is about Bayern Munich and they do take a national pride as Bayern Munich is the team from Germany. So there's a, they do have pressure. The wins, um, Thomas Muller said, are relief. You know, the performances get dissected, cross-referenced. And there's a reason that uh, we're going to talk about it in a minute that Julian Nagelsmann has been fired as of today. And Thomas Tuchel will take over that job. Crazy stuff. Uh, Tuchel famously took over the Chelsea job, but was fired for, I guess, Aaron Sekabal, irreconcilable differences with Boley. My guess is that Boley wanted to sign um, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Tuchel was like, over my fucking dead body. And Boley looked around and said, 
I'm pretty sure I bought this team for three billion dollars. You can go fucking fuck off. And so <laughs> Tuchel got sacked. Um, I, I I don't envy his position, but um, Bayern are not having a great season. They're one point behind uh, Dortmund, even though they're like on a, they have like a 25 goal goal difference lead. They're way 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 ahead of Dortmund in terms of uh, xG, but they are one point behind. So seven draws really what's holding them back. Uh, even though they're plus 45. And if you go into the nerd stats, everything says they're going to win that league. But performances matter. Underlying performances don't matter. The results are the results. As much as I like to talk about stats, you still got to win. You still got to translate those stats into points. It's just really to give a sense of why or what you see being right. So Dortmund coming off of the the year break, uh, they won 10 in a row and they really took off uh, and chased Bayern Munich down after being eight points behind. So Nagelsmann is sacked. That's how fucking serious they take shit in Germany. He's not losing the league. He's still in a quarterfinal against Bayern Munich. Bad performances got Nagelsmann sacked. They're just like, nah, not today. So Nagelsmann was, I don't know if he's still the youngest coach, but he was the youngest coach in Europe, famously doing a great job with Leipzig and Hoffenheim. Is it Hoffenheim? I can't remember. Or was it Hertha? I don't remember. But he's a progressive coach. He's a he's a Guardiolista. He's a possession based. He's a he's a tinkerer. He's in that he's in that Guardiola mold. And uh, I'm not sure if um if it really worked with with Germany and it really worked with Bayern Munich. It's really these super clubs that have tradition and have history. They really 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 take the performances really hard. And there's a reason why coaches get sacked all the time for what for a normal club wouldn't matter. But for these clubs matter, like Ancelotti's in trouble at Real Madrid. He wasn't able to beat Bayern, uh, Barcelona. This sort of stuff really matters. And so Bayern Munich kind of restarting, trying to get that bounce from Tuchel, who we saw when he took over from Frank Lampard, really made a difference. The difference with this takeover, though, is Julian Nagelsmann is not Frank Lampard. Frank Lampard barely coached or coached something in the range of barely. And Nagelsmann is a real perfectionist. And I could see him uh, going to Spurs, honestly. That would be a great move for Nagelsmann to try and get his chance in the Premier League and move on from there. Uh, for City, City are coming into form. City are playing well. The, not, the Holland thing is working. It seems the yelling at the team two months ago from Pep has made a difference. But there's only 10 games left. City are eight games behind, eight points behind Arsenal, and do have their moment there. For Milan versus Napoli, Napoli are running away with this league. Uh, Milan are, you know, sitting. Oh, my God. Milan are on 48 points in fourth place. That's how bad Serie A is. Uh, Lazio's in second on 52. To give you a sense of the difference in the Premier League, 48 points. Oh, no, it's the same, actually. I thought it was going to be a big difference. But yeah, 49 is what Tottenham's on. I was going to take a shit on uh, <laughs> Syria, but I didn't have to. I didn't realize where the points were in any other leagues. But Napoli are the best team in Europe this year. They're sitting on 71. That would be three points ahead of Arsenal if they were in the same league. So it's pretty exciting to see where they are. They've got the league like, wrapped up there, 19 points ahead of Lazio. So Milan will take their scrappy fighting Milanese uh, to try and beat Naples. Um, listen, stranger things have happened, but this is, you know, Leao's team. This is Olivier Giroud, Brahim Diaz, uh, you know, former city cast off. You know, they, they're they a good team. Mike Magnon's there. Come back after a long time injury. Good goalkeeper. Their best players are decently young. You know, Kalu, Teo Hernandez, Tonali, uh, not so much. Um, uh, Vanessa are also really good. So a lot of good young players with a mix of older players like um, Giroud and Zlatan still hanging on at 40. At, is he on the team? Where's Zlatan? I thought he was on AC Milan. Oh, no, he is. He's just way at the bottom of the list. <laughs> I didn't see him there. Yeah, Zlatan just played four games this year, scored his first goal of the year. So, um, you know, they are – they stay in a shot, but you'd expect – uh, Napoli to beat them. Um, Napoli, Cavaciella, Osiman team is rolling. Chucky Lozano got the right team. It's great for Mexico. Um, and then the other matchup, and they do get the home leg in the second leg for Napoli. And then Benfica and Inter. 
Uh, Inzaghi has Inter as a club, as a cup, uh, as a cup team. They kind of do well in their cups after taking over for Conte. They were the one of the teams to beat Napoli. So Inter will feel good if they can get to the semifinal past Benfica. But Benfica are fantastic. They're you know scoring two point seven points a game. They've got Jao Mario, uh, Gonzalo Ramos. They are really really good. I think the issue that we have with the Portuguese teams is how good are they really? Um, do you know what I mean? Like they're playing in relatively easy leagues. This is where you're scouting. This is where your team has to really know itself because they can't really rely on the results and how they play within their own league. They've got to rely on how they behave within European competitions. What we've seen from Benfica is that yes, they can win it, but you know, it's that strength of schedule thing, that strength of, of can they can they do it, you know, on a cold night in uh in in Milan? I'm not sure. I mean, they're not considered a top five league, but Portugal have produced really really good players and really really good results. Famously, Porto under Jose Mourinho. So we'll see where they go there. And then in the semifinals, we have a chance of, you know, in the final is going to be some Italian team, either Milan or Naples, or some. You know, Italy has a chance at an Italian team in the final. Three other four on their side are Italian with Benfica making up the other one. So in a Southern Italian team is going to be in and a team out of that top group is going to be super disappointed. So between Real, so Real and Chelsea then will play between City and Bayern and then we'll see what happens in the final. So Napoli have a really good chance of being in the final. Do not be surprised. Don't fall for those narratives. Napoli will get there if they can. And then we'll see where we are from there. So that's a lot on the Champions League. Wow, I didn't know I was going to do that much. But, uh, you know, it happens. Um, Just on some of the things that are going on, I think the interesting piece here is um, the Nagelsmann firing of Bayer, at Bayern Munich. That's crazy. Um, he was considered one of the great young coaches in Europe. And, you know, he just didn't live up to the standards of what Bayern expected. And I think that goes back to some of that stuff I was talking about with Conte and institutional strength and what your team represents, what it holds on to, what are the values of the team. And for Bayern Munich, it is a team of excellence and it is the team of Germany. Um, probably in the 2010s, they got the label of Hollywood FC. There was a lot of drama. Uh, this was under uh, Van Gaal. And, you know, those were the two seasons that uh, Dortmund in 2010 and 11 to 11, 12 were able to actually win in, in, um, in the Bundesliga. And they're the last champions since, since, um, since Bayern, Bayern has won 10 in a row and they look like they're going to win 11, but they have had fights. They are pushing. It is a battle for them to hang on. And we're thinking about, where they are. So institutionally, Bayern do not accept failure. It's not something that they will allow. It's not something that they can do. Um, and so they fire a coach who's just had bad performance and the board didn't like what they heard. One of the things that's interesting about uh, German football and the Bund and Bayern specifically is former players go and become part of the club. So um, Oliver Kahn, very, very famous German international goalkeeper, World Cup winner, is the sporting director. Uh, and, and their team is littered with their former players who, unlike the UK, do speak and do get interviews. So there's much more chatter from different voices and they can disagree. So you can get conflict within the media about how the team is playing. So for Bayern, it's a big deal that they didn't work out. And that is that institutional change that is just like every country's football is different. Every structure is different. How you celebrate, what's okay, what's acceptable. And these are the things that are really amazing about football and what make it great. The game stays the same, but culturally changes across countries. One good example of that is in Germany, if your team is winning, it's considered respectful to continue to play and try and run up the score. While in Italy, it's considered disrespectful to try and continue to win and run up the score. So in Italy, if you're up 3-0, 
in the first half, you're supposed to take let the dogs off and not try and score more. Whereas in Germany, if you're up 3-0, you're supposed to keep going to respect your opponent. Different ways of thinking about respect, right? Don't don't inflict pain on me versus I respect you so much that I think you'll come back, right? These kind of interesting, subtle differences um, that, that I think make for different leagues and different things and different things of how people do things. Um, so that's fascinating. We should be, I would be remiss. Uh, I'm going to completely change gears and move someplace else because we had a good chat um, in the in our in our WhatsApp group. Please ask if you want to join. And it was around um, the program Ted Lasso, <laughs> which has now come back out. This goes to some of the institutional stuff as well. Um, just thinking about how Americans are, how do we view as Amer- as American football fans the growth of Ted Lasso? And is it embarrassing to us? Uh, Christian, our resident um, GarCast listener and Forest fan, asked us, hey, does that bother you guys? And I went on a long tirade about, no, it doesn't. I, I'm a I'm a big tent fan. I think some people, and I know Mike Salerno was, was like this about hockey. He never wanted the casuals to come in and w- didn't want them to change the rules and liked the obs- obfuscation of like the sport. Like, if you don't like it too bad, this is my fucking sport. I don't feel that way about football. How you get to it is up to you. As long as you fall in love and have the moments, that's all I care about. Because I know that once someone has a moment, uh, a bicycle kick, a winning in squeaky bum time, an Aguero goal, uh, a going up against the playoffs for Forrest, um, for Brentford going up in the playoffs, for you know for Arsenal this season, those two late wins, the one against Villa and and the and the and the draw. Uh, that that just happened so just these kinds of things that make you link i just want everyone to love the game as much as i do because i've had like these experiences of tears of watching games and not understanding why i start crying like uh the one one uh that i always talk about in january in january of 2019 the john stones off the line against liverpool at home i wept I didn't understand it. I was sitting at my desk at work and I started crying. Uh, Just unbelievable stuff like that. And if Ted Lasso is what gets Americans into the game, then so be it. Um, And I think it does show something that English people don't understand about Americans. I'm not this way. (laughs) I wish I was, but I'm not. Is our optimism, is our belief that we can do it. And that's what the Ted Lasso character is. And weirdly, as much as Jesse Marsh didn't want to be that way, that's what Jesse Marsh was. He was certain that the next game would be the result to turn around. He was certain, excuse me, my heater's too hot. He was certain that Leeds would get the rub of the green and his next result would be the right result. Or that the underlying numbers of his team, that it was creating a lot, and he was right, was going to turn it around. And he just, you know, he just had an effervescence of Americanness. And one of the things that makes... Americans, what they are, not all of us, but some of us, is the belief that you haven't seen me do it. Uh, Europeans do not have that. It's very much stay in your station, stay in your lane, stay who you are. I think about uh, there's a German bar in New York, Lorelei, that, you know, we've been going to whenever I go home for 20 years. Uh, and I can guarantee that I walk in there and Utbar, Utbar, Gunter, excuse me, Gunter will be the waiter there because he's okay with being a waiter. That's his job. That's what he does. He's not trying to be more. He's not trying to be less. He's still bringing steins. He's still bringing things over. I don't think he's an owner. He's just the waiter at Lorelei. And that's okay for him. And that's what he wants. If you are in your 50s and you're still a waiter in the, as an American, people will think, what's wrong with you? And he's now been there 20 years, probably came over whenever. And then I think about things like, you know, people ask me, why do you think you can do that? Well, because you haven't seen me do it yet. So Americans just have that attitude and Europeans just don't. (laughs) There's too much shame. Uh, The English are always knocking people down. Oh, you've got too much money. You've got too much this. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you're bigger than the game? You know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff like that. Like I I think about the way not that Paul Pogba is someone who deserves defending, but the way he was treated in the press 
the, hey, Mr. Fancy Boy, Mr. Big Shot. There's a lot of that coming from British football pundits, especially um, uh, Graham Sunis and um, and Roy Keane. They're just like, who do you think you are? Be humble. And they don't like bravado, whereas American sports love bravado. We love our wide receivers. We love our basketball players. We ooh and ah over them, whereas England and Europe, they don't. Neymar is is shunned. We don't like uh, dancing Brazilians. We don't like we want a guy to shake a hand, score a goal, and not do anything. So I think that comes through with some of the things about uh, about Jesse Marsh and Americanness and how I think American players are viewed. If I could transition to that, I have a list of questions uh, that John John Santana sent me. Just a bunch of things to chat about, just in terms of you know what what questions are out there to talk about that that have come up during the season. We haven't had a chance to talk about them. Things like you know how are Americans perceived? Why are they perceived the way they are? There's still a belief ultimately that American players aren't good enough. We don't play enough. Um, whatever. And I don't think that that's true. Uh, we have good players. We figured out some of our middle-class problems where it was very a very rich sport. And it's still predominantly a middle-class sport uh, in the U.S. It's less working class. It's less seen as the sport to play to get out of poverty the way basketball and NFL football are. And I think, you know, especially in the African-American community where it is still, you know, that sport is still a way out. Sport and music are still the way out. Whereas in England, all those working class guys that are from the north of England, sport and music is the way out. Just think of the personality of a Liam Gallagher is the personality of the average northern football player, working class kid, you know. So that's kind of England doesn't have that many work middle class or upper class players. In fact, they might not be any. They're all working class. So in the US, our our players are predominantly suburban, predominantly middle class, have some money to play for club sides that are very expensive. So our players are good. They're well trained. They spend a lot of money on training. And and I know John and Manny probably know much more about this than I do because I don't have my daughter in in club soccer, but Training in the U.S. is very high end. Our pitchers are very nice. We do work hard with the players, but there is a pay to play. So we're missing that sort of bottom of the barrel player. And once they get to the level of, you know, your 16, 17 year old where big clubs are coming in, they're as good as any other player. And our players are much more coachable and hardworking, especially that middle class kind of ethos versus um sort of iconoclastic ethos. So, uh, and there's a reason why German teams are finding American players. And there's a reason why we have an almost all U.S. men's national team of internationals that are playing abroad, where I think it might be, there might be only one MLS player in our group because we've been pushing and getting our players in there. What else does John have for me? Let's see. Um, Relegation zone special. Johnny, I talked relegation so much. It is a fascinating group. We still have seven teams, four points apart. Uh, we're going to find out so much about that. Um, one of the things, if if folks don't know, is um, relegation in the U.S. is a giant, giant discussion that happens in this country where our sports are designed for profit and for disappearing. And we don't have clubs that are institutions where they can start up, last a few years and disappear, and no one cares. So that's one of the things, whereas... Something like in England, if Bury disappeared or Wrexham disappeared or or um, Derby disappeared, that would be a big deal. It would be a national institution for those people to have it disappear. Whereas in the U.S., we have teams. Cosmos currently don't exist. Rochester Rhinos, dead. Uh, every team from the old NASL, they're basically all gone. Some of the names are being resurrected, like uh, the Sounders are an old school team, uh, Vancouver Whitecaps, um, the San Jose Earthquakes. Those are older teams. But there's the L.A. Aztecs. There's the uh, Washington Diplomats. There's tons and tons and tons of US NASL teams that were part of our leagues, and they're just gone. And that's just the nature of American thought and business is we're OK with having closed leagues. But if you fail, your team disappears. So we, there's no trap door. We go for profit. And if we don't make a profit, your team dies. Whereas in England, 
you have a team like Oldham, who were one of the founding members of the Premier League and are now in Division Two because they've been able to slide down and down and down and down. And so rather than go bankrupt and disappear, your team just slides down the table. And it would be nice to sort of see it that way. There's two sort of ways of thinking about it that Americans don't quite get yet, which is promotion and relegation allows for a team that can't sustain itself to still exist within the pyramid and slide down to its level and let teams that are aggressive and do spend move up to the levels that they feel comfortable with and spending with. So in, rather than the sort of closed oligarchical structure of uh, these teams that are all locked in where there's a set amount of money that they need to survive and if one team fails, the whole thing disappears, this allows for a sort of permeable system where teams can survive and thrive at the levels they need to. Now, I know most people don't think that way, and I'm sure the business owners of the teams in Europe would love for there to be a closed league, but by having the threat of promotion and relegation and the hyper-competitiveness, teams find their levels, and teams are able to rise and fall based on where they need to be, whereas American sports, you hit the floor, and you can just sit there and collect your check which is gross, right? Like if you think about something like Sunderland, if they had been in the US, they would have just sat at the bottom of the table and just collected their Premier League money, which is why teams want it. So that's pro-rel, that's there. Um, uh, let's see, let's see. What makes a great manager, John asks me? Delivering on expectations. How a manager does is based on the club that he's at and where they are in their journey, right? Um, finishing 10th with Brighton is great. Finishing 10th with Chelsea is bad, right? So that's Graham Potter. Um, finishing 6th with Brighton versus finishing in the relegation zone would have been terrible for Deserby. So it's all about the expectations of the club and where they are. The other piece, so that's one thing, that's the X's and O's, but that's the bottom line piece, right? Like, where are you in the table based on where your fans expect you to be? So that's one bucket. The next bucket of what makes a good manager to me is, is the team playing better than the sum of its parts? I think the classic, or or two, sorry, not better than the sum of its parts, but to the skill and ability of the players on the team. And I think that's where Thomas Frank and a, and a Sean Dyche come in. They are managers who get their players to buy in to what they need to do and play a way that does not accentuate what the players can't do, but accentuates what the players can do. You can defend, you can run hard, you can get to on second balls, you can win corners, you can win on set pieces. And those two teams epitomize that. Whereas, but Brentford has probably better players because they have a bit of a money ball approach. Whereas Dyche had no money at Burnley and kept his team in the league for seven seasons with essentially the same players. I mean, Ben Mee and Tarkovsky went to war for him for seven years and he didn't change his center back pairing. He sold Michael Keane once and replaced when when um, when I, either me or Tarkovsky got injured one season. But otherwise, it's the same group. Um, so it's all about expectations of where the team is supposed to be, style based on the players that are on the team. And then the last piece, I think, is pure style right? Do you play attractive football, right? Mourinho does not, and he gets results, and he gets away with it. Um, Nagelsmann was known in lower divisions for having pretty football, but when he reached a higher level, that wasn't enough, right? He needed results to go with it. So I think it's a combination of expectations, are you getting the best of your players, and then style. Uh, I would say those are what make a great manager. And then I think the other piece that is needed is charisma. You know, I think one of the things that has kept Jose Mourinho in the limelight, even though his style of football is fundamentally poor, is that he's sometimes a bigger personality than the players on his team. And we can go to Christian's club, Forrest. Um, Brian Clough was bigger, was a bigger personality than his team. So, when players came in and tried to challenge their authority, they were the club. They could embody the club. I think Klopp has that sort of strong personality and Pep has that strong personality. In Pep and Klopp, you have ones that cover all of it. 
they play to the expectations, they have the style, they are improving players, and they're charismatic. They've got all the bases covered. But I mean, I don't. I, I think Klopp and and Pep would admit if they didn't have the players, they would lose. But they just happen to be in these situations that they're there. Uh, if I had a a ruling on some coaches that I really love that are doing a good job that I think are under the radar right now. I think Ruben Sellis at Southampton, just watching that Spurs game, that team is good. They're playing hard. They're coached well. I, I He's probably going to go down, but I think that was interesting. Um, the Thomas Frank experience, that positivity, that optimism that the team plays with. with So they think they can win, but they respect their opponents. Uh, I think Thomas Frank is someone that I really, really enjoy. And I like the way Brentford play. They're always, you're always up for a battle. Um, Arteta, he's not even 40 yet, I don't think. And he's already up there. So we've got a new coach that could be something big. I don't like Arteta's complaining. (laughs) It's a little bit much, but, you know, they all do it and he'll get better about that kind of stuff. But uh, I do think that those are the coaches that, um, that we have um running around i don't want to talk about var rules changes john i don't want to change the rules what i want to do is get rid of var i don't want time limits i want none uh and then side team recommendations everybody knows my side team my side team is brighton uh, if you don't watch brighton you've got problems side teams there is a they're usually side teams i think are usually a reserve for It's reserved for style. You want to see a team that either finds interesting ways to win or plays really good football and finds interesting ways to lose. Just be fucking interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, a side, like I would never see someone have a side team of like Burnley. Nobody wants to fucking see that. Uh, it was never fun when they won and it was never fun when they lost. You were just like, I'm glad you lost, you fucking deadbeat scumbags. I could admire them and I can admire Dyche. But I never enjoyed watching them. I did enjoy uh, Pochettino's Spurs as a side piece, especially when they got those eighty-six point seasons. I do. I did enjoy Potter's Brighton, but I'm enjoying. Um, I'm enjoying Deserby's Brighton much more. Although I haven't watched them as much, Matoma makes me so fucking happy. I couldn't even tell you. Uh, so, so we've got through John's question. Side piece team, just you know. It's just so that, you know, if you're if you're a supporter of a big club and you know where they are, you have a little bit of you can put a little bit of skin in the game and in your bottom things. So, Manny, entry for today's podcast, Italy's continued struggles, England two, Italy one. Uh, I'm going to look into that right now. (laughs) Uh, And I'm just going to check that out. yeah, I mean, Italy not playing well, I don't think is a surprise because they've been poor. They missed the last two World Cups, but have been really, really good in the Euros. Um, England got a goal, I believe, from uh, Declan Rice early, a scruffy goal. England are still playing that shitty, pragmatic way that they have been playing. It's, you know, just how they play. Um, you know, we can we can give more plaudits to our friend, uh, Mr. Harry Kane, who did get his record extending and record breaking goal. Uh, the regular starters, Stones, Maguire, Shaw, Walker, Calvin Phillips, Declan Rice, Bellingham, Saka, Kane and Grealish. Pretty standard team. We don't we're not seeing Sterling. He's out of form. Um, we we saw Ivan Tony on a bench. He's still yet to play. Trippier came on. Reese James came on. Foden came on. And Gallagher got some minutes, which was interesting. Uh, Luke Gaw- Luke Shaw got a red card, but I don't think that's a, a really big deal. But, I mean, it, it is a big deal that Kane is actually uh, England's all-time leading scorer, passing Wayne Rooney. You know, Harry Kane is metronomic. Uh, he's perfectly boring. He does his job. He scores his goals. And he leads England. Um, I don't think he has a strong personality where you want to see him on tv his hair lip in interviews becomes annoying but you know england get the job done it's still boring boring southgate um i get it for tournament games i don't think he's a good coach he doesn't make good 
substitutions. He doesn't get more from this team than you'd expect. I'd love to see a better coach. I don't know who that would be. I used to think it was Graham Potter. Now I'm not so sure, uh, especially after what's been going on with Chelsea. But hey, Potter could still turn it around if he can stay with Chelsea and get another round of good games in. For Italy, this becomes another another referendum uh, at home to lose to England in a Euro qualifier. I mean, they'll probably make it. They've expanded it to 24. They made the last Euro there. Are they Euro champs? I don't even know who won the fucking Euros. I can't even remember. <laughs> I know that England were in the final. Were they in the final? I don't even know. Uh, I have to look it up. But yeah, Italy... Italy um, not being... Italy not being in these World Cups and then not making it is just sort of baffling, <laughs> sort of shocking, uh, just blows the mind that they haven't won. Let me just, I'm just going to make, yeah. All right. Italy. Yes. Italy won in 2020. I'm such a clown. I totally forgot. On penalties. Right. Got it. I remember now. <laughs> it seems so long ago, but I guess it's four years ago now. So it's 2020 and now uh, we're doing this strange my brain is melted uh i covered it we covered it on the podcast we covered all of it uh with the fans going into the stadium at wembley now it's all coming back to me thank god i have this podcast so i can remember stuff otherwise i would forget all of it um but yeah it's still very dour stuff from southgate he's not a great coach uh you feel if we were talking about that earlier that idea of what makes a good coach not Southgate, right? Southgate is all vibes, but he's missing the charisma. He's missing the style and he's missing the idea that he's making players better. He's taking players and keeping them at their level. No one's really thriving with him. He doesn't have charisma in the sense that you want to follow him. He is protecting his players and he is developing a sense of unity. The players like him, which for England is a big deal, but I think he's going to go one cycle too many uh, by keeping this job. He's not a good coach. Um, he's just not. He's just another middling English manager, people pusher. Um, you know, I don't think he has a strong enough personality, but there may not be strong enough personality for uh, for the English team. It's just shocking and surprising <laughs> that that happens. Uh, let's see if I can get uh, some friendlies. Uh, I'll just check it out, see what other games went on. I believe the U.S. is playing against Grenada. I mean, we've got like games, you know, there's always U.S. men's national team stuff. I am so not interested in what's going on with the U.S. at this point. Um, I think we know, you know, we have the controversies with Greg Bolharter and Gio Reyna. That's sort of boring. You know, it's very schoolboy stuff. Uh, CONCACAF Nations League, not much going on there. Mexico plays Suriname. Okay, that's fun. European qualifying. I don't even know what country this is. SVN, Slovenia, defeated Kazakhstan. That's fun. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina beat Iceland. Remember, Iceland were fun. Uh, Denmark with the hat trick from Holzland, defeat Finland. That's fun. Luke Shaw did get a red in that game on 80, but England hang on to win. Um, Portugal and uh, our friend Ronaldo scores two more goals against Liechtenstein. Way to go there, buddy. You're really padding stats there. And then just a bunch of other games and friendlies and things like that. So we had some things. One thing that's interesting is the Argentina playing at home versus Panama. It's fucking bedlam to get anywhere near Messi. Uh, just so much good footage of him just trying to go out to dinner and people just following him around. He's finally... Finally, uh, Messi is loved the way Maradona was loved. Uh, I guess you just have to win. I guess you just have to win uh, to get to where you need to go. Um, so we're here. We'll give a little bit of a sense of where we are. Um, Premier League is off. We come back on April Fool's Day, uh, April 1st. The schedule looks like this. Manchester City play Liverpool in the early game on Saturday, returning from an international break. What could go wrong? It's going to be great. Uh, Arsenal play Leeds, along with Forrest playing Wolves. Brighton get Brentford in the battle of Bees and Bloom and Benheim. That's a great game. We'll cover that more as we get closer to it. Crystal Palace with new coach. <laughs> Roy, Uncle Roy Hodgson is back. I didn't cover that too much. 
I don't know what's going on with Palace. I thought it was funny that Vieira got fired and then they went to freaking Roy Hodgson. Just bizarre. Uh, against Leicester, Bournemouth play Fulham. And then the late game is Chelsea versus Aston Villa. And it looks like there might be a Monday game, but I'm just going to check the rest of the schedule. Nope. It's, oh, yep, yeah, there is a Monday game. Everton versus Tottenham at Goodison. Oh, Sunday games, West Ham, Southampton, Newcastle versus Manchester United. That's a big top four battle. I think when we get closer to that, Newcastle versus Man United at St. James's Park is going to be a real barn burner and a test for where, if Newcastle can get their top four hopes back on track. We know United had a good run when Rashford would score all those goals, but then it, they've kind of slowed down, kind of hit the bump. They got their league cup, but where are these two teams? I feel like United and Newcastle are kind of measuring sticks for each other because they're not quite there. They've both had really good runs, and it's about who can now kick on and who can now push themselves towards these last 10 games of the season and really reestablish where they are and the good vibes for the season. Both of them would hate to finish out of the top four. I don't think United will finish out of the top four, but Newcastle would absolutely love to finish in the top four. Um, speaking of top four, I totally forgot. We have the Conte saga that I talked about last week. Um, no new news there. You know, they haven't fired him. There have been rumors of firing that Ryan Mason would take the team for the last 10 games of the season. I think this really puts Spurs in a in a weird spot. They really are sputtering and just kind of sitting in their space right now and not much really going on. So lots of stuff to talk about. We'll pick it all back up on Monday and we'll get back into it. But I hope that this sort of catch-all potpourri episode of the Squeaky Bum Time podcast found you in good spirits, found you in a place that you want it to be, that um, you can ask questions anytime. Please, please, please let me know. You can join our, um, our WhatsApp group and you can absolutely ask questions. You can absolutely be part of the show anytime you want to. All right, here we go. That was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with me, Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Channel and presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple or anywhere you're listening, please rate and review the show. It makes a huge difference. Thank you, good night, and good luck.